Three billion human lives ended on August 29th, 1997. The survivors of the nuclear fire called the war Judgment Day. They lived only to face a new nightmare, the war against the machines. Wait, hang on, no, sorry. That record scratch according to my invisible watch would have happened 20 years ago, but didn't because, you know, Terminator 2 isn't actually a documentary. It's just a movie. But a good movie and, uh, you know, robot apocalypse. That could happen at any time, really. Skynet uses time travel and considering Terminator 2 is about to get re-released in 4K and also taking into account that said 4K disc comes with one of those endoskeletal Terminator hand jobbies. I mean, what if it is real? Skynet, Terminators, Hasta la Vista, etc. We bought the hand, we put it in our homes. We're all Miles Dyson, we didn't even know it. You know what that calls for? Terminator 2 retrospective. I mean, you gotta watch it now. I just proved that Judgment Day is nigh. Rock solid argument, can't argue, because you're not on camera. So, you know. Come with me if you want to live. Okay, first of all, Terminator 2 is a sequel to Terminator. I don't know if you knew that, mind blown. I only mention it because James Cameron sold all the rights to any potential franchising of Terminator for a buck. One dollar, because he really wanted to direct the original Terminator. So I hope that was worth it because Terminator movies make it some money. Which is good news because Terminator 2 had the biggest budget of any movie ever in 1991 with 102 million dollars. It's not a big deal now, but you know, it would be a pretty big deal if James Cameron had never become a director considering Avatar is still the highest grossing movie of all time. And Titanic is number two. And to bring it back around, Terminator 2 is, I think, the movie where James Cameron really perfected his filmmaking formula, which is a blending of really tight practical action sequences with technology pushing CGI, and most importantly, character struggles by way of reversals of fortune. But before we get to that, just a quick refresher in case you haven't watched Terminator 2 in a while. Terminator 2 is a movie where two time-traveling robots are sent back in time, one to protect the other to murder John Connor, a young man who will grow up to be humanity's last best hope to defeat Skynet, an artificial intelligence responsible for a nuclear onslaught against all humanity referred to as Judgment Day. It's a story about a young man struggling with his destiny, a mother struggling to prevent that destiny, and a robot man struggling to smile right. Also, there's another robot called the T-1000 made of liquid metal pretending to be a cop. It's a very serious motion picture. Chill out, dickwad. All right, with me so far? Okay, we now return you to your explanation of the trilogy of James Cameron's essential filmmaking tricks already in progress. Number one, tight practical effects. So, there's a sequence early on in Terminator 2 where John discovers that Terminators really do exist and has to escape the liquid metal Terminator with the help of Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator. Get down. <laughs> It's a really critical sequence from a narrative perspective because it has to reveal who is good, who is bad, has to define the height of the stakes, has to make sure we relate to the good guys and hate the bad guy, and most importantly, it has to look awesome. And James Cameron accomplishes all of this with a chase sequence. And he does it with this pseudo David and Goliath imagery. We establish on a single wheel of Arnie's motorcycle and, by comparison, the T-1000 liquid metals his way into an enormous truck and gives chase with the goal to, you know, kill a child. It's not hard to know who you as the audience are supposed to root for. One guy has a teeny tiny and the other has a big enormo. You vote for the underdog. That's human nature. And it's mostly practical effects, so you don't have to worry about the uncanny valley where someone doesn't look real. In fact, if anyone doesn't look real, it's the T-1000 with the... CGI liquid metal, right? So he feels alien and off, while Arnold, despite also playing a robot, still seems grounded in our reality because throughout this entire sequence, he is always just a dude on a motorcycle trying to save a little boy. And the stakes feel huge, right? A big part of that is because it's all practical effects and so it all feels real. But there's also this microcosm, macrocosm. In the moment, a bike has to beat a truck in the long term, one man must overcome an entire robot apocalypse. Because we can visualize the former, 
we come to understand and believe in the latter. Okay, that's number one. And since we talked about the T-1000 and his liquid metal body, let's slosh our way over to James Cameron's move number two, using fancy CGI to impress the viewer. These days, James Cameron uses CGI pretty liberally. Avatar was mostly CGI, but he learned the art of using digital effects wisely in Terminator 2. And the best example of that is actually a really subtle one, which does what you have to do when using CGI. Marry the computer generated with the world of the practical, so we see them as one and the same. So John Connor can't beat Skynet alone, right? Who does he need? Mom. Sarah Connor. But Sarah's in a mental institution because she thinks robots are gonna end the world. What a nut. So John and Arnie come to save Sarah. The T-1000 shows up, pretends to be the floor, kills some people, yada yada. And then we get the most important moment in Terminator 2 as relates to the T-1000. So, it's another chase sequence. James Cameron really loves chase sequences, apparently. You got steel bars on one side, John, Sarah, and Arnie on the other, the T-1000. What happens? The T-1000 CGI liquids himself through the bars, but he gets stuck for a second because he's holding a gun, which isn't liquid, right? So your brain thinks, oh, the T-1000 can't make something that isn't a part of him liquid. The CGI gets a rule that roots it in the practical world, and just like that, it becomes real, which makes it feel real impressive. So again, Cameron is using something he loves, fancy CGI effects, and in the process gives you, the audience, a reason to associate the CGI with the rest of the film world while also increasing the stakes within the narrative. Which brings us to our last point, character-driven plot and reversals of fortune. This is the real meat of Terminator 2. The practical effects in the CGI are just the dressing. They are important dressing, but what gives all those set pieces weight is the characters and what they want to do versus what they feel they must do. And what's interesting is that we've talked so far primarily about John and the T-1000, but the majority of Terminator 2 is actually about Schwarzenegger's Terminator, the T-800, and Sarah Connor. Remember my goofy quip about the T-800's plot being learns how to smile, right? So funny. Well, that's actually kind of true. At the beginning, he's an unemotive machine programmed to do whatever John tells him to do. You have to do what I say, huh? That's one of my mission parameters. So at first, we have no reason to connect with him other than because we're watching the movie, much like the T-800 has no reason to connect with John beyond he's there and he's supposed to. But then, John teaches a robot death machine why killing people is wrong. And over the course of the movie, the death machine learns not to be a death machine. And the T-800 ultimately asks a pretty fundamental question. Why do you cry? You mean people? Yeah. I don't know. We just cry. You know, when it hurts. And by the time we get to the end of the movie, after the learning not to kill and all the self-sacrifice, he gets it. I know now why you cry. But it's something I can never do. And that's a massive reversal since in the first Terminator movie, the T-800 is 100% pure death machine except no substitutes. Most important of all though, is Sarah Connor. There's a long stretch of Terminator 2 where the T-1000 isn't around at all, which is dedicated mostly to Sarah Connor's inner struggle. She's struggling with the good T-800 and there's this moment where she realizes that Arnie's the best dad John's ever had and she just kinda snaps. So while the T-800 is learning to be human, Sarah decides to be more like an emotionless Terminator. She knows there's this guy, Miles Dyson, who is the reason Skynet happens, so she just concludes she can prevent Judgment Day entirely if she just terminates him. Sarah takes her guns, steals the truck, and basically becomes the Terminator for most of Act 2. And while, of course, she can't go through with it, she gets pretty close. She shoots a guy, she definitely thinks about murdering a child in cold blood for a minute there. But again, that reversal is what provides the emotional stakes. You can show a robo-apocalyptic future. You can set people on fire and have them explode. You can even have the kid from Salute Your Shorts be in your feature film as a clear harbinger of the end times. But none of that carries weight without inner struggle to match the outer one. The Terminator movies have this credo, no fate but what we make. It's the belief that Judgment Day isn't written in stone. 
but Sarah follows that belief so doggedly that she perverts it by becoming something just as evil as the fate she's been trying so hard to avoid. And if there's one thing you should remember when looking back at Terminator 2, it's that in its best moment, it walks humanity right to the edge of deserving Judgment Day and then shows us we can be better. Even a robot death machine can understand why we fight, why we sacrifice, and why we cry. Good job, Terminator 2. Thumbs up. See you next time.